poverty has always been with us. Uh, neoliberalism has done nothing to resolve it. Uh, the last SECC was was a grim reminder where fifty six percent households had no land whatso whatsoever, and ninety percent households uh, were without a single person who earned more than ten thousand rupees a month. Now into this uh, uh, rural hinterland, we have a huge mass of returning migrants, uh, and uh, and together, uh, what is the future for them? Uh, and then there is the consequences of a pandemic amidst a totally broken health system. Uh, there are the social consequences of fear and scapegoating and discrimination. Uh, what will our uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, Muslim uh, brothers and sisters face? What will single women face? Uh, what will the aged face? What will children without care face? And probably, worst of all, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, what is going to happen to them in these times? Uh, uh, the absence of any kind of social rights net, except thankfully, NREGA and to some extent, the PDS. Uh, so how grave do you think this crisis is? What is its nature? What has brought us to, to the point, uh, to this point? Uh, really, I, you know, I, I thought the first time, the first round, we would just talk about how, how, how truly serious is, uh, is the nature of this crisis and, and what is its character? So may I request Prabhat, uh, firstly, to come in uh, and, and, and respond. Thank you very much, Harsh. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, yes, I, I have no direct experience of the crisis of partition and the human suffering that that gave rise to. But to my mind, uh, in the entire period after independence, I have never seen anything like this in terms of the depth of the humanitarian crisis we are witnessing today. But even worse, that this particular crisis is sandwiched between a crisis which was already there, an economic crisis of the world economy, within which there was a crisis of India as well, which was already there even before the pandemic struck. For instance, we know that unemployment before the pandemic, unemployment estimates put it at a level higher than ever in the last 45 years. And what is worse, when the pandemic is over, well, if at all it is over, but you know, suppose, suppose in some sense we limp back to a kind of normality, actually there would be some irreversible changes which would have been introduced into the economy and into our lives, uh, which actually would mean the perpetuation or, the, or an accentuation of the crisis that had preceded it. Let me just give you an example that the people who have gone back to the villages are obviously not going to have a level of income which is anywhere comparable to what they were having earlier. Uh, at least unless specific demands are made, specific movements are launched and so on, this is not going to happen. Now, to the extent it does not happen and they're not willing to go back to the cities, you'd find that actually their incomes would have gone down, demand would go down, and as a result, there would be an overall worsening of unemployment. So sometimes this feeling that we have that, all right, some people have left towns to go into the villages, but the total amount of employment in the economy is the same or would be the same as it was before the pandemic, that assumption itself is not right because the very movement of people would also reduce the amount of employment that the economy would have even if uh, the, the, the specific pandemic caused unemployment is something which is done away with. Now, this is something which actually was affecting the lives of people in general pretty drastically, even before the pandemic struck. And the pandemic, of course, has worsened it greatly. For instance, we know that, that per capita real consumption expenditure in rural India was 8% less, per capita, 8% 
less in 2017-18 compared to what it had been in 2011-12. That's for all. That's just the average. Now, if that's true of the average, you can imagine how much worse it would be for Dalits, for women, for the marginalized groups. Therefore, we were in the, and 8% is, is a lot per capita. You know? so, so we are really in the midst of a crisis even before that. So serious that the government actually suppressed the, the, the information relating to that particular NSS round. But in that, then the pandemic comes in and this huge de-urbanization, which would put even greater pressure on the rural economy. So we are in the midst of an absolute, real, serious humanitarian crisis. How we got there, which is the last question that you have, but I think essentially in the world economy, as well as in the Indian economy, in fact, in all the economies, major economies of the world, which reflects itself, at the global level, there has been a very sharp increase in income inequality during the period of globalization. I would put this increase in income inequality somewhat differently. I would say that there has been a rise in the share of the economic surplus in the total out. By economic surplus, I mean all the property incomes you get and all the incomes of people who live off the property incomes, while the non-surplus is basically the wages and, 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 and the incomes of the working people. Now, any such redistribution implies a reduction in demand. This is something because per unit income, uh, the working people consume a lot more than the surplus earners. So every such redistribution implies a shift of, of a, a, a reduction in demand. At the world level, there was a reduction in demand, which is was reflecting itself as well as the Indian economy is concerned. Within India, there has been such an increase in the share of the surplus. And therefore, we were witnessing this very serious structural constraint on growth and, 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 and structural crisis, which was engulfing us. And on top of that, the pandemic has struck and has given rise to this very serious humanitarian problem. Thank, thank you, Prabhat. Uh, that's 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 really sobering uh, uh, for, for you to say that uh, after partition, uh, this is probably the, the biggest humanitarian crisis that we are seeing. Microphone close to your mouth, please. Yeah, and and and, it, uh, and that it's a crisis uh, that uh, uh, that already existed on which uh, the pandemic and on which the lockdown uh, have 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 piled. On uh, uh, Gopal Guruji, uh, I, 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 are you there? Yes, yes. Gopal. So, if you could please, uh, please see how you look at this this moment in our history. Thank you, Harsh, for inviting me to uh, converse with other experts on the very important issue: uh, broken economy and the future of social rights of the marginalized sections in this country. Uh, to, to respond to your uh, first question that uh, is it really very worst in the history of crisis? Yes, definitely it is. As Prabhat has already rightly mentioned as the crisis which are humanitarian in nature. That is to say that it is actually affecting uh, not only the economic, the political, the social, but most importantly emotional uh, stability of human being. Uh, earlier, before the pandemic, people actually, as Prabhupada has already pointed out, it is all accumulated. It is the manifestation of accumulated crisis in terms of unemployment, uh, wages, ec economy. Now, the manifestation uh, has led to a kind of a, a emotional depression of people, and that is why you find people do not want to stay back in the cities and they are on the road and their journey has been so tragic. Uh, so, uh, so it actually is affecting all the important aspects, core aspects of human existence uh, in, in, in life. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there were crises, there were uh, worst kind of crises, 1972, 71, 72, drought situation actually really hit people very badly, lower state, state of the society. 
and the food crisis and unemployment and all that was there but this is i think this different and and it is actually affecting uh, not only economy but the entire structure which actually will give you some guarantee to survive meaningfully uh, uh, in the society now uh, the most important point that i would like to share with you is the uh, the in the kind of inequality we had before pandemic uh, uh, was uh, uh, was there but as and when pandemic grew into its worst uh, degree that the economy the material suffering actually was uh, was replaced by the emotional insecurity of the people uh, and uh, therefore i think people those who are in the street working classes were actually not caring for the material guarantee that the states uh, were and that the, the states are offering to the people to stay back and the opportunities will be opened up they don't care they are going back and that is i think most important uh, uh, dimension of the pandemic crisis so emotional going back to the villages near, stay, staying very close to the intimate is the uh, concern now that only means that the civil society and the government in the cities has not cared much about these people and they have actually uh, been abandoned uh, uh, so i think emotional depression has been very very uh, deep uh, in the present cuz that's one worst uh, manifestation of the crisis now when they go back to the village as prabhat has already said there will be some kind of a pressure on on the local opportunity structures it will be very difficult for the local government the local local might become hokal but the hokal hokality is vacuous i guess because you know there is there is going there is no there is no infrastructure there is no uh, possibility of opportunities coming up at the local in the immediate in the immediate uh, future so i think be there will be some kind of a disruption between the demand and supply at the local level as well and therefore unemployment will always be uh, there and it cannot be taken care of immediately and waste structure will always be uh, a problem uh, and wages will wages are going to be down and they will not go up and so that is one uh, worrying part uh, that uh, the government or those who are actually thinking about uh, uh, restoring broken economy they will have to think about it so that is one challenge uh, that 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 is going to be there and what else the other other problem has you said other question no, no what brought us to this point why, why okay. so especially the psychosocial that you talked about uh, the collapse of faith why do you think we we yeah, reached so this point i i think robert has already mentioned uh, that uh, it is the insensitivity of the government to really respond to the crisis of un- unemployment uh, and uh, and respond to it immediately after it was actually uh, it it actually was single i mean it was signaling it was it was giving warning signals to all of us at least you know they getting into the action to really take care of all these workers uh, could have been avoided actually but that didn't happen now a uh, sudden imposition of lockdown has really uh, paralyzed the whole moment of people going so that i think is one uh, uh, immediate consequences but mm-hmm. overall the many manifestation of the crisis the pandemic has is not sudden it has it is accumulated the crises are accumulated and therefore i think uh, uh, we can actually go into uh, defining what were the crises how were they maturing into a big crisis Uh, mm-hmm. that we all know but let me actually uh, uh, tell one thing uh, about uh, the what is the status of social rights in this pandemic now that's the lead question that we have to raise mm-hmm. uh, and can you really uh, meaningfully talk about social rights can you really meaningfully read in them in terms of actually providing ac- access to opportunity structures and how and and in the social actually what is important is to give them give the workers and the marginalized section of society employment 
that will restore their dignity uh, back. But that doesn't happen, as you very rightly mentioned, that people have to queue up for a small portion of meal, uh, uh, for two kilometers, three kilometers, and yet they, when they reach the end, they find there's no food available. So it's the kind of frustration and depression. It is, it is much more morally so coercive and corrosive that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that we have seen. So I think it is uh, the accumulated crises uh, that are manifested in a, in, in, in a very disproportionate manner. Uh, so that's what I would, I would like to say. Thank you so much, Gopal. I think it's really important that you underline uh, the psychosocial character of the crisis. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the complete breakdown of faith of our working uh, poor on, uh, on their government and also on middle class society. Uh, uh, and the absence of any kind of hope uh, uh, the the stripping of of dignity, I think all of these are, are really crucial aspects. And the second point that you made was that this is cumulative. This is not something that has happened suddenly. Uh, it is really the outcome of of a much longer breakdown of of pre precisely these uh, these elements of social cohesion, which is trust and 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 solidarity. Uh, Aruna, uh, I can't see you. Are you around? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, okay. So, Arna, if you could uh, come in uh, now, uh, you're, you're uh, the closest uh, in this panel to, uh, to the realities in rural India, you're in Thelonia, and, uh, and, and yeah, w w how, how does the crisis look, look to you uh, from where you are? Harsh, uh, you placed me at a very critical point of being one of the older members of this panel and I was a year old when partition took place and um, I don't know if Prabhat and I are the same age or we are one year apart from each other but I happen to be in Delhi now and I don't think even then I mean though memories are very uh, very very vague and very uh, hazy but even in my younger age age when I was a nursery school student and I was in primary school the atmosphere around was one of hope. I mean, there wasn't this kind of complete lack of hope that we see today. And I do think it's been one of the worst crises. Because uh, let me just go down a few things. And I agree with so many things that Gopal and Prabhat have said before me. But it is the callousness. Actually, people always hoped that, they, that society and the state would not be as callous. It's this callousness that has really... I think in one sense, uh, that one cannot have any positive outcome of callousness, but what it has done is really taken away the scales from people's eyes. And to some degree, they've been able to see through the uh, bombast, the propaganda, the hollow promises, and all those, uh, you know, all those fatuous statements that have been made over time and again, time and again. And the caste composition has become very, very clear. So has the class composition. The kinds of callous <laughs> remarks have been made about the migratory people, about them walking on the street, about their living there. How many of us have voluntarily gone out to feed anybody? How much of the population has really even thought of itself as, 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 as obligated to give food, let, let alone anything else? You know, we are a minuscule lot who are really working very hard. But by and large, they are only seen as a utilitarian uh, commodity of labor, of producing things, or the, what will happen when they leave. But the human condition has really bypassed most of India. And that is, for me, one of the worst crises. Apart from the callousness, we, uh, it has actually removed the fig leaf, in other words, from what middle class thinks and what the state thinks. But if you look at their own position now, it's the fear of the unknown. Actually, we really don't know what's going to happen. See, when you know something's going to happen, then you get ready for it. We are, we simply don't know sitting in rural India, except for NREG and the PDS. And that's why there's so much mobilization today in Rajasthan because of continual lobbying with the state, with the government, and continually meeting people. You know, I have been forbidden from going out because I'm over 70. But most of my friends are now actually back there with their masks or what are the sanitizers. They're going to NRG work sites, we're mobilizing people. They're doing everything despite all the personal risks 
of, uh, I don't know if there is really a personal risk, but whatever they may be. They are, and what do we say now is that except for NREG and all the well-known rights-based legislations we passed at some point of time, and the hope that the welfare state may function and we can force the government to deliver, there is nothing else. All the tools we knew that we could use, the only tools we are left with are what we've got out of the rights-based legislation. You can't mobilize, you can't speak out, you can't even uh, project what is wrong in a big public forum. And the challenges have grown. We had a kind of, we now are in a new kind of poverty. And this new kind of poverty has to be defined. And I think that's where uh, we would really need the help of the theoretical members of this panel. Because what is poverty? It can no longer be defined in older terms. Poverty today is completely different from the kind of poverty that we so easily identified, say, 30 years ago. So in that kind of new situation, our workers, Rajasthan has, of this 40 lakhs today, we have many of them are migratory workers working on NREG. We gave the largest workforce in northern India for construction work, apart from many others. So these, all these migratory workers are back now and they do not see, it, it's, an, it's an irony because migration was always seen as the last resort of joblessness, of unemployment. So when you are unemployed, you always say, okay, I'll migrate, you know, I'll go off to Jammu or to Delhi or to Bombay or to Ahmedabad or Gujarat or here or there, even to Karnataka and Kerala to earn money. But now migration is seen as a horror. So people are coming back. So the flip side of it is now is the time to really build on Indian RDG. Now is the time to really build on a rural economic agenda. And Prabhat has been talking about it. So has Vijayanand. I've heard both of them. And I also feel, we also feel in the NKSS, it's a good time to expand the NRGA to make this 100 mandatory days of work exist as they have always been, which is, which is an entitlement, which is people driven, which is, you know, uh, which, which creates assets for the people. But the rest of the days will have to be labor centered. I mean, we can't again take them to bondage. We can't take them again to being part of a system where they are helpless, but that they have the option to opt for any other kind of work, cottage industries. Maybe you have uh, working on the agriculture farm, Chief Minister of uh, Punjab has actually written to the Prime Minister today saying that he wants uh, NREG to be allowed to work, people from on NREG to be allowed to work on, uh, on agricultural work because he says otherwise Punjab's entire agricultural work will just collapse. So if so, in what terms? Does the worker actually opt to work or does, or do they get mandated to work in a particular place without an option of change? But if they do that, then it's a labor camp. If you use modern language, if you use our ancient system, then they are bonded, you know, and that we don't want. So it's a very, very good time. And I think I'm very glad that there's Harsh and there's Prabhat, there's Joyti and there's Gopal and there's Vidyanan, that we can all sit together and brainstorm to see how exactly these new systems are going to function. And I think it's a very good time. We also need uh, an urban employment guarantee about which, again, I think all of us have mentioned before, we've all agreed. But we'll also probably have to think of the NDNRG as it is today to go into D and C class municipalities, which are really small towns. They call themselves small towns, but they live like villages. So they, from the hinterland, maybe they can draw people. We prevent these large scale migration to metropolises. They go and work in the hinterland in these small Kasba towns, which we call Kasba towns in northern India, these small towns. And there they can get employment uh, in small production factories. They, and self-employment should become a very important thing, including people who push these handcuffs. You know, people who are hawkers. People, all this should be seen as self-employment. And I think a whole range of new possibilities will emerge. And I think it's a time we must all push because this push will take us into uh, a place where we can re-establish all that we have lost possibly in the last so many years. And of course, the labor laws, if we do not bring that into the center of our debate, we lose everything. So we'll have to reclaim and fight for labor laws. And today, more important than even bargaining power is fighting for basic social and economic rights. And social rights and economic rights are vitally important. And today, it's Eid. 
So Eid Mubarak to all of you. It is an important day for all of us to re-establish that we will not bring in the communal agenda. We will not bring in the communalization, not only of COVID, but communalization of everything else we know, of narega, of food security, of hawkers. People are not buying from people who are Muslims. The first thing that we've been doing in Barmer is to ask the name of the individual who's selling vegetables. Because if you have a Muslim name, they're not buying vegetables from you. So we have a lot of work ahead. But I think it's not in the nature of an activist to lose hope. So I think the NPSS has been madly trying to see what else it can do and how it can work it. Because if we lose hope and sit down, then it's the final, final victory of people who want us completely destroyed or the ideas that we all hold together completely destroyed. So we have to fight back. So I'll leave, uh, stop now at this optimistic note that we must and have to fight back. And the question only is how? Thank you so much, uh, Arna. Uh, you know, what you said at the earlier part of your presentation, I remember conversations with you about your childhood memories of, uh, of just after partition. And you did say it was a time of hope. You also said it was a time when people uh, with great dignity, uh, uh, you know, uh, rebuilt their lives uh, in very difficult circumstances. Uh, and maybe what you, the latter part of what you were saying was about you know, which is really what we'll come back to in the third part of the discussion today is what do we do in the future? How do we help rebuild uh, with hope and with dignity? And I think those are very important questions uh, uh, as well. Uh, uh, may I bring in Patrick at this stage? Patrick's uh, been one of the most sort of uh, uh, perceptive uh, scholars of 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 Indian society uh, from a distance. Um, how do you see uh, and understand the crisis? Of course, you have uh, the crisis in America to compare with. And we, it would be interesting to see how do you see the crisis in India? How does it compare with what you see around in, in the United States? Uh, Patrick, you're, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Still muted. Okay. Thank you, Harsh, and, and thank you to the center for organizing this extraordinary panel. And let me just say how honored I am to be part of this uh, amazing conversation. Yeah, I, I, I would make uh, four general points, all of which are somewhat comparative. It's been said that this pandemic is a, a physical exam of the social body. Um, what it's done, in India, as it has in the United States and other countries with deep-seated inequality, such as Brazil, is it's, it's really laid bare just how deep those fault lines are. And tragically, it's amplified all of those fault lines. So be it the fault lines of, of class or, or caste or community, what this pandemic is doing is exasperating those those deep-seated inequalities, including the, the, the structural economic inequalities that Prabhat already talked about. And what worries me is that beyond the immediate effects, um, you know, the loss of livelihoods, the hunger, the desperation are the long-term effects. Because if there's one thing we know about inequality, is that it's cumulative. So uh, children who will, are deprived of nutrition today will suffer in the future from stunting. Um, children who don't go to school, and this is a problem here in the United States as well, you, you know, the middle class can learn from home and has the resources to, to manage this crisis. Uh, the working class um, is, is being um, adversely impacted on any number of fronts. Uh, the, the, the being cut off from educational opportunities, the livelihood impact, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's difficult to exaggerate the long-term uh, cumulative effects of, of the pandemic on inequality. The second point I would make is that this crisis has exposed underlying institutional weaknesses. And as we look across the world, um, some countries have had more effective responses and some have had very ineffective responses. And the difference really lies in the, the degree to which uh, existing institutions can provide social protection and welfare. 
Uh, and so some of the responses in, in Northern Europe in particular have been relatively successful, but in, in countries that already had a weak um, institutional capacity and, and relatively weak welfare states, we're, we're seeing the effects uh, amplified. And um, even within India, um, the, the impact is, is much more uh, dramatic in the north than it is in the south. And, and Mr. Vijayan, no doubt, can, can talk to us a little bit about Kerala, which is at least a source of some optimism in, in these really difficult times. Um, and those institutional weaknesses are, are having absolutely de debilitating effects because as, as Aruna and, and as Harsh have, have already underscored, there's a loss of faith in public institutions. And, and again, here, the, the comparative differences are striking. The, the response in Kerala, which has been so successful, not only in flattening the curve, but also addressing the welfare crisis, is a response that's been built on the strength of people's trust in public action and public institutions and, and faith in political leadership. In the rest of the, well, in most of the rest of the country, quite the opposite has happened. Given the callousness and the indifference of the government, people are losing faith in institutions. And once you lose that trust, it's, it's incredibly difficult to rebuild trust. Um, and so that, that's a very um, um, uh, big concern as well. And then the, the final point I'd, I'd simply underscore is this is also turning out to be a, a, a crisis of democracy. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this later, but in the United States and in Brazil, uh, as bad as the crisis had, has been, uh, at least it has triggered some political pushback um, with uh, upcoming elections in the United States. There's at least some hope in a, in a change of regime. And Bolsonaro is finding himself in a very deep political crisis because of his response to the pandemic. In India, the, the central government has taken advantage of this crisis to double down on its repression of civil society. And again, that amplifies the problem of trust, but also what it simply does is undermine the overall capacity of the state to provide a coordinated response to this crisis. And this isn't just a crisis of the immediate moment, of course, it's, it's a crisis that's going to be with us for years. And, and without some coordinated approach from the center, it's, it's difficult to see um, how the, the worst of the welfare effects will ever be addressed. And the long-term erosion in faith in democratic institutions and principles uh, is, 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 is something that's really extremely alarming. Thank you, Patrick. I think, uh, you know, I agree with every word. Uh, the, the crisis in, 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 I mean, it has shown uh, a pandemic in a highly unequal society. Uh, it only exacerbates those inequalities. Uh, your, your, your caution that these inequalities uh, and the consequences of it will last across generations is something I hadn't thought of as clearly as you said it. And I think that that is even more worrying that it's not, you know, long after this crisis passes, uh, uh, people uh, who have suffered injustice uh, at this moment are going to bear the consequences of it for a long time. Your reminder about the, the loss of faith in institutions uh, and in democratic institutions will also last for a long time. And I think that's, that's a truly, truly uh, worrying aspect of the crisis, and thank you for bringing these in. Uh, I, I'll call in Joyati now, please. Uh, you know, you've heard a lot. W what is your reflection on what 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 really is is the gravity and the nature of our crisis? You 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 you. you, you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, you know, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said. This is absolutely by far the greatest crisis I've certainly experienced and certainly the greatest crisis I believe in independent India. And it is going to be something which has very, very severe effect, as Patrick said, as Prabhata said, over the medium term. It's not something that is going to go away tomorrow or day after, no matter how what the government response is. I think people have already made a lot of the important points. I just want to add one thing, you know, that none of this was really so necessary. And I think that's very important. We're constantly being told that the pandemic has done it. No, 
the pandemic has not done it. The government response has done it. We did not have to have such a brutal lockdown imposed at four hours notice. No other country did that. Our neighbors all gave a week's notice, five days notice, 10 days notice. We, did, we could have actually enabled migrants to go back. We could have informed people that this is going to happen. We could have done it more gradually. Even if we wanted to do it at once, we could have given sufficient advance notice to state governments, to the people in general, to allow them to make some kind of arrangement. We could have warned them that they're going to lose all their income for at least a month, possibly longer, which is what actually the government was thinking and knew full well when it said three weeks that it was going to be longer and so on. We did not have to create the kind of humanitarian catastrophe that we have done. Because by doing that, not only have we generated an economic depression of an unprecedented proportion, which is going to take massive, massive public expenditure to generate any kind of recovery. But we've also created a worsening public health situation. If we had allowed migrants to go back earlier, we would not have the kind of massive spread of infection that we're now seeing across the hinterland and in states that really don't have health infrastructure in Bihar, in Uttar Pradesh, and so on. The rates of increase of infection are so rapid now. And they're going to be spreading to villages where there is really no health facility to speak of. So we've, we've kind of destroyed it on both levels. The, the state action has actually damaged the economy in a massive, massively, but it has also added to the public health disaster. And I think it's important to note that it was not necessary. That's very, it's a critical thing because we keep saying it's an act of God, if you like, you know, it's a pandemic. No, it was the policy response that did it. The next uh, thing I just want to, to point out is, is this whole issue of, you know, the migration, the, the massive distress migration that we've seen, the forced migration. And the, the, the general discussion in the, the mainstream media is all about, oh, will they come back? Will we get the people to do our construction activities? Will our manufacturing be able to? And, and so, you know, it's all around that. And the overall uh, attitude seems to be, which comes, I think, from the deep inequality that Pramada mentioned and the deep caste and class discrimination that is so embedded in our society. The attitude seems to be that if you make things rough enough for them and wherever they are, they will come back. They'll have no option and they will be forced to work on whatever terms because that is, um, you know, finally they'll have to survive. Now, it is true that there might be some element of that in the short term because things are going to be bad in the villages, even with an expansion of energy, even with, you know, and at the moment, I can't even see that the government will allow much of an expansion. They have only brought up the expenditure to the level that it was supposed to be at the beginning of this financial year. That our estimate of the requirement was 102 lakh crore. Okay, so already, you know, it was. Uh, it, they haven't really put out sufficient money for NREG in the for the rest of the year. So we don't know whether it will genuinely expand. And clearly, it's going to be an extremely deep depression in both rural and urban India for the foreseeable future. If the government does not spend, and at the moment, again, there is no indication that it will spend. Okay, Actually, the fiscal stimulus is not 1% of GDP, which is what everyone is saying. It's actually negative. I think this everyone has to get this in their heads. The, the central government is not allowing state governments to spend. State governments are constrained by the tax revenues they can raise. They will not be able to increase their spending beyond the point. What they could possibly do is shift some money around here to there. Over the period, their spending will fall. There is every indication that the central government also intends to let its expenditure more or less respond to the fact that its tax revenues are coming down. So in fact, the fiscal stimulus may well be negative for this economy, not positive. We are therefore looking at a major contraction. Now, in that kind of a situation, honestly, I think all predictions are are up for grabs. You know, I don't think we are in a position to know what this level of distress does for a society, for a polity. Because we have never experienced, I don't think, this level of distress. Maybe Bengal famine, but again, it was localized relatively. We are going to see such unimaginable distress that I really do not think that even the government can anticipate fully. Even their attempts to control dissent right now, lock up a number of people who were engaged in peaceful protests, who were trying to uphold the constitution, etc. 
those attempts also may not be adequate to meet uh, the kind of complete chaos which is likely to emerge from such a major, major destruction of the economy. So I don't want to sound apocalyptic, but I really think that this was a man-made catastrophe. And I say men advisedly, it was men who did it. Uh, it was a man-made catastrophe. It, did, it was not generated by a virus. It is being worsened by policy actions of the government at present. And it is leading to outcomes that I think we simply cannot anticipate because they're so extreme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joyti, and I, I can't again agree with you more. I wanted to underline that it's not just uh, the outcome of public policy choices that have been made now. It is also the outcome of public policies that have exactly. made in the past. Exactly. And really three most important ones, I think. One of them is is the, you know, uh, the complete uh, destruction of whatever public health system we had. Yes. I think that that is one, uh, you know, for consequence. I mean, if 80% of, of doctors work in the, uh, in the private sector, 80% of, uh, you know, the 66% of beds are in the private sector, and they've completely stopped uh, contributing at this point of time. I, I and, and, you know, I was reading that two thirds of, of, of the districts don't have a single testing facilities, two thirds of the districts, that's where uh, the virus is going to spread. So these are Public policy choices that we made in the past, our, 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 our you know, our unwillingness to give any kind of social rights and labor rights to the to the large mass of the working poor is the second uh, segment, and the third is uh, the huge gaps that we've left in our food security arrangements. I mean, I think that these are public policy failures of the past, and now the choice of the lockdown. All of them have have created, and it is man-made. And, uh, and 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 terrifying for that reason, Vijayanand. I don't know, uh, you know, how you're going to come into this discussion. Uh, we do want to know about Kerala, and we do want to learn from it at latter parts of this discussion. But just in terms of the crisis, you also have a lot of workers in Kerala, uh, and uh, you know, just even through their eyes, how do you see this crisis? You'll have to unmute. Uh, One thing which you can say is. It's been a rapid downward spiral, pulling in more sectors of development, more people, more areas, and nobody knows where it's going. It's worsening, though in outward figures it may not look so bad. And all in a situation of economic decline, not spree, joblessness, growing inequality, not only of wealth, income, but also of influence and power, and avoidable socio-political tension. So it may young days we had learned that, learned of the ratchet effect of different factors of poverty now this is working in the whole economy the whole ratchet effect and is pulling it down that's my impression and how did we reach there i thought i'll uh, spend a couple of minutes on that as was mentioned delayed response people have not highlighted that you're talking about kerala on 12th of january kerala alerted his rapid response force 12th of january and here we come in middle of february and two months for a nation. Everybody talks about war. It's yeah. 25th much. March. 25th yeah, 26th March. March. But they started speaking around 15th March. Then sudden lockdown has been mentioned. And in a recent webinar, Professor Abhijit said, said, we announce, then think, and then plan. That seems to be the new sequence. That is extremely dangerous. And something which I've been noticing in government, I could even see it before 2014 also, Equitable development is not in the political intellectual discourse. And even asking for basic rights, look, you look like a mad fellow. And the sole fake focus these days, even Kerala got into the bandwagon briefly without forgetting its other aspects, ease of doing business. So that is our sole focus. And, and then, as you mentioned, neglect of human development, public health. And just imagine the suggestion of Nidhi Ayo that your district hospitals be privatized. Talking of district hospitals, it's not that we have capacity, we had capacity. But if you have the essential infrastructure, you can ramp up the capacity. When Nipah struck Kerala, Kerala did not have a single lab in the whole state. We had to go to all the way to Pune. And within uh, one month of COVID, 18 centers have started, 16 of them in public. So if government wants, with limited resources, you can. That's a big lesson from Kerala. Not that Kerala is one of the most fiscally 
at something which is worrying is the informalization of the labor relations. And I would blame the trade unions. They are focusing on the organized permanent workers and not on the contract labor. And Manisha is still uh, rings a bell. And another thing which is recently happening is the forced so called formalization of the informal economy through technology and tax and not through building capacity, skilling, and uh, diversifying. So it's a very artificial kind of formalization which has rattled the MSME. I, could, I can see it even in Kerry. Then, of course, total weakening of the labor laws and social protection and the public's another thing which is a recent, very recent thing, probably best revealed in the uh, FM's features these days, we have equated re public sector reform to privatization. It's an extreme step. Earlier we thought we'll impress competition and all those things were there. Now nothing, it's there. And what is even worrying? Failure of the guardian institutions, Human Rights Commission, SCST Commission, and then judicial activism is almost dead, especially vis-a-vis -vis government and vis-a-vis -vis poor person's rights. And another thing which has not been followed, I've worked in plan for a long time. Killing the plan was suicide. Suicide for SCSP, TSP, minorities, persons with disabilities, they're all linked to the plan. Planning was no, nothing great in India for a, I mean, for, for a long time, but at least there could be some discussion on what are the priorities, some data coming up, knowing where the weaknesses lie, that we have lost. And another important thing, which India has no local government system, except Kerala, to some extent or another. West Bengal is not that well rooted. And then, of course, you mentioned it, shrinking space of uh, civil society and independent media. And worse is class interests can be killed through communal interest. It's extremely dangerous. And where do you go? At, at least at this time, I thought there will be a movement for workers, movement for labor, movement for the poor. But then you forget that essential human thing and go back to a very primitive kind of uh, I, flip. That's all the points I want to make at this point. No, but isn't all of that very, very useful. Uh, you know, uh, how did we come here through through a whole set of failures, uh, well beyond the three that I had uh, listed? And and and, and thank you. Uh, the second question, and I find that we spent a lot of time on the first, quite rightly. The second is an easy one, which is uh, how do you evaluate what the government has done? And I, I propose that we go through it much faster, because the last part of the discussion is really what you feel needs to be done. So maybe a quick, you know, more rapid fire kind of uh, round uh, on uh, on what do you think? Uh, how do you evaluate uh, the government's economic package? Uh, its attempts to rebuild the economy, Prabhat. Uh, the... Well, you know, the government has literally done nothing by way of rebuilding the economy. In fact, Jayati is quite right. If anything, its impact would be negative. Mm -hmm. That basically, when you look at the package, much of it is simply credit offers, making credit available to various sectors. Now, you know, Keynes had a, had a, had a remark uh, earlier. He said that you can truncate a boom either through a shortage of demand or through a shortage of credit. But you cannot, but for truncating a slump, you require both, not either. So in the absence of demand, if you simply make a credit offer, you would not even have takers of the credit. As a result, what the government has done really is something which amounts to nothing. If you look at the total amount which the government is, in all its various pronouncements, which the government is making available through fiscal means, it comes to less than 1% or just about 1% of the GDP. The whole idea now is to stimulate demand and the government seems almost to be unaware of it. Or if even if they're aware, they're too afraid of credit rating agencies and global finance to be able to do anything about it. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Gopalji? Uh, uh, thanks. So uh, the response has been very meager, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, reaching out uh, to people, providing uh, facilities to the people, 
what we have to understand is the structural infirmities that cannot be rectified by the government for example in mumbai uh, slums uh, are so much saturated and congested that uh, intervening there with some promise of medicine and health services becomes absolutely difficult mm -hmm. so what happens uh, unfortunately is that the it is not the government it is the people who are held responsible for the for the for the worsening of the crisis so in a way a very uh, as they say discursively uh, the responsibility is being individualized it is not the government but the individuals who are responsible they are not keeping social distancing they are not following rules and all that so and therefore i think to really there is a lack of rationality among the people therefore you have to bring rationality from outside through police and other 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 mechanism so i think this is uh, this is a bit of a difficult issue i mean uh, how to understand uh, how to evaluate the performance of the government is uh, also uh, tied up with the responsibility of the people but all said and all all, all All, all is, what is important uh, in this regard is to see that the government is not acknowledging that it has certain structural limitations to handle the crisis in terms of in terms of conducting phase in terms of providing infrastructure in, in terms of actually uh, regulating food and other medicinal uh, facilities to the people so there is there is there is a problem with the government no doubt about it but the real problem is that the government is not able to actually comprehend the uh, comprehend the way it has to really reach out to the people mm -hmm. and handle the confront the crisis for example if there's one person calling from a house and the government doctor is going he finds 70 people waiting for the treatment that is a very it's a very very it's a very dicey situation in a way so i think it's really uh, it's very difficult to really make a very final comment on uh, on the assessment of the government yeah, yeah. i i mean i in, in simpler words the government seems pretty clueless that that yeah. you know whether it is on the economic or on the health i mean i really find them uh, you know saying one thing one day saying the opposite thing another day yes uh, and uh, seeming a, a completely confused apart from everything else Uh, Aruna, would you like to just do a quick evaluation of of uh, 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 what the quickly, government? Quickly, quickly. Of course, unemployment is one huge thing which they've done nothing about. What the money that they've given the NRGA has just, uh, uh, as Joyti said, appears much more than it really is. But the point is that the push from below is so hard now. there is something giving in at least in the state government levels let's see how far it goes but it's not a great promise we have to fight for employment look at let's look at food security what about those 77 million tons of food grains what have we got only 8 crore migrant workers have got 5 kilos each it's a laugh what have one, we got in 1 you know, million tons out of the 77 million tons out of the 77 million tons so where is the food security why can't they distribute food to people who are hungry and unemployed and there's no possibility of employment really full employment so i think if you take that and you take health they're not getting attention even covid patients or possible covid patients there's no testing and normal natural illnesses are causing deaths in the villages because people are not able to access health so we really need to look at a national health service we really need to look at all these fundamental basic things that they are not getting i'm not even going to schooling which is such a huge disaster children have all lost one whole year because they can't do digital education they can't do digital exams most of the children can't access them so you they've really lost a year and i don't know what else they've lost so i really think one great fear that we all have and had which is that this kind of new attitude of the state of the government to so every single issue is going to set us back to begin fighting at the baseline for our basic rights and then it thrusts us back there so i think if you look at food health literacy education we are back almost to square one in many cases so i think that would i would really say is what's worrying people in the villages the most patrick uh, your evaluation 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think all the key points have already been made. So uh, let me just quickly put this into some comparative perspective. Mm -hmm. the, the obvious countries that one would want to compare India to are the United States and Brazil. Those are the two other very large federal democracies. And all three are currently governed by regimes that have uh, clear autocratic tendencies. And I think one of the lessons of all of this is that autocratic regimes are terrible at dealing with crises like this. And, and for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, first, they have tunnel vision. Uh, they speak mostly to their supporters, um, which, uh, and, and, and have a lack of empathy. So the response has not been uh, one uh, driven by empathy and a sense of solidarity. It's been driven by short-term, narrow political calculations of playing to your base. And we've seen that with Trump and, and Bolsonaro and, and with the center in, in India. Um, th there's a lack of willingness to work with subnational governments. And, and more than anything else, the, the lack of coordination um, uh, preceding the lockdown uh, was, was catastrophic. And not, not consulting with chief ministers before locking down the economy was, was pure madness. Well, likewise, in the United States, Trump has had a completely hostile attitude to governors and has even tried to assert authorities that he doesn't have. And Bolsonaro has, has literally accused governors in Brazil who have tried to address the pandemic as being communists and banditos, you know, the, the Brazilian version of urban Naxalites, basically. So uh, the, the, the great, you know, for those who had any kind of illusions that authoritarian regimes are better at handling crises, I, I would hope that they are now completely uh, dissolute. Uh, by, by, by just how irresponsible and, and ineffective these uh, increasingly autocratic regimes have been. As I said earlier, though, the one silver lining in the United States and in Brazil is that neither Trump nor Bolsonaro um, control the legislature, and they haven't been able to repress civil society. So Br Brazil has actually pushed through a basic income grant that's quite generous at the behest of civil society through the legislature, and the United States is doing something I'd never thought I'd see in my adult life. Is it's, it's actually reconverting itself to Keynesianism and trying to prime pump the economy. And again, largely because of the Democrats. Unfortunately, in India, you know, Modi has near hegemonic uh, powers at the, at the central level. And so there's really no pushback. And, and that, to me, is more worrisome than anything else. Yeah, well, uh, Joyti? <laughs> you, you're... Yo, yo, yo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think Prabhupada already highlighted the sheer macroeconomic stupidity so far, and of course, the meaninglessness of this so called uh, big package, the Atma Nirbhar uh, Abhiyana, whatever package. I just want to pick up, you know, just to add to that, what is so evident throughout this two month period has really been very, very striking the sheer caste, class, and gender bias of this government. Every single action, the, the class differentiation has been so evident. Yeah. You know, whether it is the way you welcome migrants from abroad and how you deal with migrants within your country, attitude to plane travel vis-a-vis -vis train travel, attitude to, you know, how people are supposed to do social, so-called social distancing and the norms that you're supposed to comply with, the implications for women the way you treat your frontline workers, your, your Anganmari workers and Ashas, without providing them any protection whatsoever. And how you, how, of course, the government, and in turn, taking a cue from that society, takes all of that for granted, does not factor in any of the concerns that women particularly would have, whether in imposing particular policies or in how you propose to treat the pandemic. I think what has really been striking is how open, blatant, and explicit it has wow. been, which I think is unlike pretty much every other country, at least every, everywhere else you're trying to hide it a little bit. Here it's now out there open. And of course, we're the only country that has successfully managed to give the virus a religious flavor, right? We've communalized the virus as well. So I think in addition to the, the macroeconomic stupidity, because it is stupid, they will themselves regret this lack of spending now. Uh, there is this 
this feeling that now you can get away with anything. You can be the way you actually are. You, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, the gloves are off. You don't have to pretend anymore. You are an upper caste, patriarchal, upper class government, you know, and you're going to behave that way. Well, uh, Vijayanand. Yeah. Just as I, I heard three, four days back, somebody, uh, government spokesman, making a theory out of this saying that we did consciously avoided strengthening demand and something else is there, but nobody has taken pains to explain how this 20 lakh will stream out into the economy. It's common sense, even ideologically you tell, but nobody has done it. So that's quite shocking. When you're announcing 20 lakhs and you're not able to say what they expect to reach where. And in an emergency, basic thing is you spend on your immediate needs. And here it's a health need. There is no kind of estimating what is required. We all have done it for simple flips, estimating what is and compensating who are spent. It is a mandate under NDRF, under the National Disaster Management Act, not in test. Some 50,000 crore, 15,000 crore was announced but details I couldn't see so far. Then states, as was mentioned by Patrick, you have not taken them into trust. They have spent most of the money. Health is a state responsibility. They have allowed them to borrow with conditions. For the first time in history, it goes against fiscal federalism and conditions are which you impose. And state is borrowing with the market, not from the RBA, at market rates and going to repay from its own revenues. So that condition and no grants to states. And SRG, self-help groups, could have been a big source. It was a bogus thing that you're, without collateral, you can borrow 20 lakhs. They're not even getting 1 lakh. So had some 2,000 rupees loan been given to SRG's members, that itself would have boosted because women are wise spenders in times of crisis. And, that, and India now has 6.8 million SRG's. Nothing for agriculture. Fortunately, that's the only sector which is more or less unscathed, though prices are low, it is not collapsed. Everything else has collapsed. But something we should have gone for agriculture, it has not gone. They are only paying what they had promised earlier to farmers. So many things could be done in agriculture. And this government is known for its public works. And no additional public work in rural areas or urban areas. At least we should have uh, absorbed the construction sector. So agriculture and construction, which provide the bottom thing for employment, has not been touched. And of course, it's a belief. I was two years in Delhi. The belief is that social security is a private function of the family and society and not a public function. That was also done. And all, all of us have welcomed Narega, but it is only 40,000 crores in cash. No labor budget revision, no inclusion of new workers, and no assurance that 100 days will be given. That alone is required. I'm not asking for more than 100. Government will say, if 100 is required, we will give 100 and consider later. That assurance is not there. Some money is there. Thank you. Yeah, so so thank you. I, I You know, the, the, the most important part of the conversation really is what do you think needs to be done? Uh, I know that it's it's a bit like talking, you know, in, in, in the air when you know that we're having a government of the kind that Choyati described so 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 clearly. Uh, and it's un, uh, you know completely unlikely to uh, to listen to any of this, but we do have state governments, and I do think as the crisis deepens, uh, there will be a desperation to look for answers, and I think we need to have faith and and think very carefully about what needs to be done, uh, and I uh, you know I, I, I so 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 really what needs to be done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, rebuilding the economy with equity, what we de do for restoring social rights and labor rights what do we do with regard to the to the health crisis and you know i think some of the the whole psychosocial uh, crisis that that uh, gopal spoke about and uh, and others uh, the political crisis as well uh, of democracy that patrick spoke about uh, how, how, what do we do about all of these uh, and you know uh, it's going to be a tough one, but uh, because we 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 uh, we have to go around, and I really would value all of us would value distinct to all of you. So if you could pick three or four critical things, and if you hear somebody saying it before you, then you could come on to something else. Dealing with the economic crisis, the whole question of social and labor rights, uh, the uh, the the health pandemic, 
extending now into the countryside, which has no facilities whatsoever of testing, uh, uh, tracing, and cure. And uh, the, the larger uh, social and political uh, collapse uh, of faith in institutions, of the independence of institutions, uh, of democracy, uh, uh, of communal sort of targeting, uh, 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 of, of, of gender, uh, you know, violence growing and, and marginalization. It's a, it's a huge, uh, you know, it is a huge unprecedented crisis. We need to think uh, and really what would you, what would be the three things each of you would, would say that we need to do uh, possibly? Prabhat, the, would you like to start? You know, I, I agree that the government is going to do nothing of the sort that we would be talking about here. But on the other hand, it's very important to actually establish what is possible, in which case you can actually have people demanding it. Yeah. Jayati is absolutely right about the, 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 the extreme open class caste bias of the government, anti, you know, patriarchal bias of the government. In, in fact, I would say the government, which is, which is very strongly moving in a fascist direction. And the idea would be to actually suggest an alternative around which then people can be mobilized. Joyte and I did a calculation, which actually says that if you have just 2% tax on the wealth of the top 1%, of the country's population and an accompanying inheritance tax that actually takes away one third of what is, you know, bequeathed every year, then you'd be able to generate 10% of the total GDP as expenditure. And that would be quite enough to finance five basic rights, the right to food, employment, uh, health care, you know, free publicly funded health care, free publicly funded education, and to pensions. So the point is that fiscally it is possible for us to have an alternative. And what is more, of course, once you have this alternative, then the nature of development itself would have to be different. I think given the fact that large numbers of people have gone back to the countryside, this may be actually a good time to think in terms of an alternative development strategy that doesn't believe in shifting large numbers of people from the villages to the towns in order to give them employment, but rather to bring employment to them where they are. So, and that's perfectly possible. That's perfectly possible with rural enterprises, small scale enterprises, the kind of enterprises that in China you had the township and village enterprises and so on. We could think of a completely different strategy that is actually based on rapid growth of the agricultural sector. You know, we, we think in terms of export-led industrialization as being synonymous with exporting to other countries. But what about industry exporting to agriculture? In which case, agricultural output has to be sufficiently enlarged. So you'd have to have the rights. You'd have to have an alternative pattern of development. It is fiscally possible. It has to be made socially and politically possible. And that can be done only by mobilizing the people around an alternative against the kind of policy that are being pursued. In other words, the feasibility, social and political, is not something we should be worrying about is existence. We have to create the feasibility. And, and and the challenge of doing that in in, in you know in times of authoritarian uh, lockdowns and uh, and social distancing and the and the breakdown of 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 even existing social solidarities of the kind that we saw and a completely uh, enfeebled opposition, uh, but it is the people of India I think that have have to rise uh, to this. Uh, Gopal, what would you uh, what were the three things that you would stress? Harsh, I think uh, uh, in terms of the alternative uh, framework to deal with the crisis, uh, uh, the immediate thing is to really, as people are suggesting, is to give money to the people so that they can be, survive immediately and they do not really uh, get them, uh, push them into some kind of deeper depression and frustration. That's point one. So I think so money going into the hands of people is one immediate, urgently required uh, task. 
Uh, second, and we have been say, saying that, you know, you require to really achieve a development, uh, even development with equity, justice, and dignity, all that. That means you have to start from the local village where you have enough opportunities where the people can really find their uh, job, uh, meaning, meaningful job. So uh, it may not really lead to some kind of a distressed migration. Now we see the we have seen the impact of distress migration. Actually, uh, cities being crowded by migration, and people actually allow cities to be crowded as long as this crowd really helps to accumulate more profit. So that that is in, there is actually some kind of a politics of allowing people to come into the cities, but not uh, looking at a even development. So that's the skewed development that we have in this country. Point. Uh, two is that, you know, what kind of equity you want to achieve in the future? I mean, or to put it cynically, to what kind of inequality you will have to have in future? Uh, um, as this is going to be, for example, uh, pandemic has done uh, some kind of a leveling impact. I, uh, the social basis of inequality and equality has been expand, uh, it has expanded across caste. Now, earlier you had only the Dalits working in the sanitation and sewage system, and you know the Dajit days taking place every time. But this time you find that because of the loss of employment, people from other castes are also coming and doing this job. Now they also have a very they also attach, attach a very different meaning. Now it is really below the dignity to do this. I mean they don't they are not sensitive about what, uh, others' dignity I, actually. I, I, Okay. I think we, Gopal, you're a little frozen. Are you? No, no, I am. Uh, I am. Is it, uh, yes. well, let me see. Okay, okay, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll just refresh it. So I think uh, what would be the nature of this equality or inequality in the future? If you really want to have equality, you have to remove the uh, remove these spaces of opportunities, which are actually dirty spaces like scavenging and all that. So that no one is actually pushed beyond the human worth. Uh, no one is actually treated as below the human worth. So that is that is much longer uh, plan of action. It's not an immediate policy matter now. It's a long time process we have, we have to actually. I would like to quote uh, for the discussion that, you know, what is this entitlement? I think entitlement one had come in the discussion earlier. Now, Locke and the John Locke's, there's a debate as, you know, provided another so this debate between John, I mean, this, this debate between John Locke and Robert Nozick, an entitlement issue has been, has been at the core of the debate, at the center of the debate. Now, in our country, what is entitled, what is an entitlement? Having actually uh, right to clean somebody's shit is your entitlement. Is it your entitlement? And so I think Locke would say you soil with, you, you, when you are fixing your labor with soil, you get your right, you get your entitlement. But here, the Dalits are actually fixing their labor with night soil. Is that an entitlement? How are you going to change this in, in the future? Is the lead question, I think. And so I think the cumulative impact of injustice, uh, in inequality has to be uh, has to be taken into consideration why you are actually planning for a long term uh, re, uh, 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 remaking of the economy. The other other point I would like to make is that you know in the pandemic technology has actually not resolved the question of inequality. Actually, it has it has deepened the question of inequality. For example, education. If you want to conduct classes or online classes, you require conditions to access those classes. But for that condition, you require electricity, you require Wi-Fi, you require everything there. Then only you can meaningfully get into the uh, mode. But that is not that you're talking about. So that inequality is actually inbuilt into a vision of the technology, the technological development. All this we have to actually think uh, in order to really create some kind of equity in the, in the future. The last point Harsh, I would make is about the injustice question. Now, injustice actually is you are actually, you are in a way, uh, it's intergeneration, intergenerational injustice. It's not generational justice. Like you are actually handing over injustice from one generation to another generation. That is to say, people 
from certain castes are actually there in the scavenging and, uh, and, and other sanitary work for generations together. Now they have established their entitlement. They don't, want, they don't allow other people tragically to enter this thing. Now, if this is the development, economic development you want to achieve, I think this is, this is not along the egalitarian normative dignified way of talking your, uh, planning your economy. I think these are three very important issues that we have to uh, uh, think that whenever you are planning for better economy or a reformulated economy. No, absolutely. Uh, the social aspects of, of, of equality, uh, Aruna, what would you... Uh, what are the three things you'd... you'd... Uh, I would say that the most critical thing today is to mobilize. Mobilize the people who have mobilized and got huge benefits for all of us in the past have been the working class, the workers, the women who have been, uh, been at the worst end of every single stick. So today we need to go back to the migrants, we have to go back to the workers and we have to look at new forms of unionization to fight against all these restrictions on labor, the various other ways in which they've been, their entire life's work for many of them has been nullified. We have to also fight somewhere for mobility. You know, the worst thing that has happened to us today that we're all trapped and I'm amazed at how Quietly, we have all gone into our little nests. And none, of us, none of us is questioning whether this COVID really is such a huge, horrible phenomenon that we all have to give up all sense of mobility. And this Arogya Setu has now become an absolutely impossible, absolute compulsion because otherwise you can't travel. You can't get into a train, you can't get into a plane, and any bookings you want to do anywhere, ask for an Arogya Setu. So I think this control of our mobility through various systems is something which affects all of us from the poorest worker to anybody else. So I think mobilization, mobility, and the another part of that whole syndrome is that we have to look at methods of self-sufficiency now in our local areas. That's why NREGA and the local fights are critical because we can begin them today. So you look at your self-sufficiency in employment, you look at your self-sufficiency in food, you look at various things which you can start trying to quarrel for and fight immediately. And then you build the larger dreams, but those have to be immediate dreams. We also, all of us have to look at transparency as a very important right we all got, which has been corroded from the PM care, which has now gone completely under wrap. And even the CAG can't look at what's happening with the PM care fund and PM cares or PM care to the last thing that's happening with us in our own areas. Everything is going into areas of complete uh, oblivion where we can't really get any information out so that in transparency and information battle somehow comes into the center of the NRDG, center of the demand for attention to health, center of the demand for everything. And we have to get back to that somehow or the other. And we also need to know what the governments are planning for us. You know, it's some kind of complete miasma and blindness. We really don't know what's happening. And that is the most fearful thing. And I think we'll have to start demanding that the plans must be put in the public domain, part of our transparency campaigns, but also bringing back the whole notion of, 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 a, of a federal system, of, a, of, of, of consulting people, and also of the notion of a bringing in the notion of a welfare state, the notion of a planned economy. There's so many things that follow when you start bringing the debate into the public domain, but what are the solutions? But at the heart of it is the person uh, who is suffering the most, is the worker, the woman, and the person who has lost everything because of these extraordinary circumstances on which they were given four hours to wrap up and go, the millions which who have been stranded, and they will have to tell us and we'll have to start listening to them. The challenge for all of us is how do we get to listen to them when we are all isolated and absolutely forbidden to move. So mobility and mobilization, I would say, are critical factors just now immediately for public action. Perfect. Uh, Patrick, you're, you're, and again, taking a larger international perspective. 
Yeah, well, I, I want to build directly on Aruna's comments. I mean, I think we all understand that rights, the effectiveness of rights depend on two things. On the one hand, it depends on the capacity of individuals and collectives to mobilize, to claim their rights, to demand their rights. On the other hand, it depends on the capacity of the state at all levels, from the center all the way to the local, to respond to those rights and to make those rights actionable. And so the, the, the meta narrative here has to be about strengthening, rebuilding and rescaling institutions. And I would say four things, if you'll allow me Harsh, four things have to happen. Decentralize, 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 decentralize. And I, I mean four different things. So first to Prabhat's point, you know, the Indian economy is spatially incredibly uneven. It's overly concentrated in large metros. We know those are unsustainable socially, environmentally, and in terms of inclusion. And so India needs a much more uh, deconcentrated, decentralized economy with more local economic development. The center has to decentralize to the states. As Vijayan Anand said, it's, it's the states that manage the line departments that have to deliver uh, both the, the health and other services that will be required to address the welfare consequences of the pandemic, which is indeed, as Jayati says, man-made. Um, states themselves have to decentralize to panchayats and municipalities. Those are the key points at which the, the various um, uh, rights and services and, and public actions have to be coordinated. And if those local governments don't have the resources and the capacity and the authority to coordinate line department interventions, you'll never have an effective, co effective coordinated um, response to the pandemic or the capacity to build lo local welfare institutions. And, you know, as, as everyone who's been following the, the case of Kerala knows, and as Vijayan has already emphasized, it's really the strength of local panchats and municipalities more than anything else that has allowed Kerala to Kerala to, to mobilize so effectively in, in, in crushing the, the curve and addressing the welfare crisis. And then the, the, the fourth and final decentralized point is uh, India probably has the weakest frontline state in the world. I mean, just in terms of boots on the ground and the kind of resources and authority and decision-making capacity of the frontline state of the nurses, the Anganwadis, of, 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 of the, the, the local public actors. Uh, there has to be a massive investment in the frontline state. And this is a win-win. It, it generates employment, but it also generates the kind of labor intensive services that an effective welfare state requires, but both to deal with the pandemic, the surveillance systems, the contact tracing, the building up of, of local health capacity, but also of building out the new welfare infrastructure that's going to be required to address the, the problems of inequality and poverty and injustice that we've all been focusing on. Joyti, I know you have to go as well, so just, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Hash. You know, I'm actually, I think all the important points have been made already, so I'm just going to use this time to answer some of the questions that have come in, specifically on something that I said about how the government's fiscal stimulus this year is actually going to be negative, not positive. And I, I think that needs to be explained a little bit. I didn't say that the package that she announced implied negative spending. But what I did do still believe is that what is going to happen over the course of the year is that in all likelihood, this government is actually going to spend less than it did last year. So let me explain what I mean. You see, what we need right now, as Prabhupada has been pointing out, we really need a major demand stimulus. Okay, And quite, I mean, I, uh, how that money is spent, I think has already been elaborated very well. But we have to have the state spending much, much more. No other segment of the economy is in a position to spend now. How people don't have money, workers don't have money, households cannot spend, investors are not going to come in and invest more in this kind of situation. It's only the government that can spend. They have to spend much more than they did last year just to revive the economy at all. Okay. The package that has been announced so far is deeply disturbing because, first of all, they put in all kinds of things they were already planning to spend, and then they've added a little bit more. That little bit more is Probably my fear over the course of the year is that this is just the little bit that they're going to spend in addition, which is at most about one and a half lakh crore. 
nothing, right? Uh, what people have said, you know, maybe 1% of GDP, slightly less than 1% of GDP. Over the course of the year, their tax revenues are going to keep falling because GDP is falling, right? We're looking at at least 15, 20% decline this quarter, maybe more. So GDP will fall, their tax revenues will fall. They will feel fiscally constrained. They will start cutting down on other spending. So the net fiscal stimulus over the course of this financial year is probably going to be negative. That is absolutely disastrous. Okay? And that means that we are going to get an even worse slump than we would have had otherwise. So clearly, what needs to be done is it quite, I mean, of course, these are the broader, you know, bigger issues that have already been raised. But immediately, we must demand that the government increases, triples its health spending, triples. I think Patrick has already pointed out how we don't, fills all the vacancies in public employment, makes Anganwari and uh, Asha workers absolutely proper government employees, gives them proper facilities, does all of the basics that it should have been doing over all this time, but does it immediately and increases a hu the spending on education because we are really, as Aruna mentioned it, depriving people of their basic access to education and so on. Uh, dramatic increase in, uh, in the rural and RGA and an expansion into urban, all of these things have been mentioned. But the point is we need very significant increases in aggregate spending. It should not be that there's a little bit of a package today, which is actually then eaten into by a reduction in spending over the course of the year. And that is what I genuinely fear, having seen what this government has been doing so far. Uh, Vijayan, your, your two or three points. First point has already been made, strengthening local governments, where I see a coalition of the elected local government with the self-help groups, understanding that India is caste system, a lot of corruption in local governments as of now, and with civil society organizations supporting. This is emerging in almost all parts of India when we had a discussion on what panchayats are doing now. That is eminently doable. And the roots of modern local governments go back to the crisis, public health crisis of industrial revolution. So they are very good at it. But now that has shrunk only to sanitation. No, we bring it back to public health. And uh, incidentally, the BJP in his manifesto has right to help people. So you throw it back at them and bring some, some, even a weak right is better than no right. And to get doctors, India produces so many doctors and even China produces doctors for India. So we need just to say to get a registration of the medical council, you need to work for two years in rural hospitals on payment, not free. So that is my first point. Second point is restored plan. Certainly government will not restore plan, but at least as a proxy plan for the social sector, which they may be willing, a scheduled cars, scheduled tribes. And migrants should now be, we have never used migrants as a target group, even in care, for your welfare and other measures. Now they become a group like anybody else as a vulnerable group, which needs a uh, group of measures. And the next point is civil society is now organizing at the local level in loose alliances to combat COVID. So this should be used as an opening to get them back into this. Now, will this have, uh, then also, which is mentioned, sorry for adding a point, the labor rights have to come back to the agenda, particularly the migrant rights. Will it get political traction? One, states. Most of the states are not with the national government. And today, UP has announced a migrant commission, for whatever it's worth. It's an unbelievable step. So we use that opportunity to focus on these rights and rewrite the code and those kind of things. All these are socially doable. But is it doable fiscally? And I'm not an expert on fiscal thing, but what the Americans call the quantitative easing is something where you will, it's just printing notes in different form. But that alone is the way, otherwise incomes will fall. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vijayan. Uh, for the last uh, quarter of, of, of an hour that we have, I ask a request now, Sharon, to quickly sort of talk about the kinds of questions that our viewers have, have raised. And uh, so in your closing remarks, then each of you could make your closing remarks, but also address some of the questions briefly. Now, Sharon. Thanks, Harsh, um, and thanks all for an extremely thoughtful discussion. We've had received a number of questions uh, uh, on what was said uh, this evening. So um, basically, I bunched them, and there are 
three or four major areas. One is um, actually seeking response from the uh, panelists on the options that states have. Um, the questions be are because uh, all of you have said the center lacks sympathy. So uh, what can the states do to earn revenue other than um, increasing their borrowing? What choices do states have to um, address uh, some of the crises that uh, erupted uh, in, in the states? There's also a question um, on how do we um, explain the fact that even when lockdown uh, has opened, industries have started working, although very slowly, workers have decided to, they're choosing to go back um, to homes. And what explains this? Um, there's also a, a question uh, about, uh, which uh, Vijananda just uh, mentioned about UP government's uh, uh, commission, uh, which of uh, uh, migrant commission. But the question also is that UP government is at the same time also trying to control mobility of workers by saying that states will now have to seek the permission of the UP government before hiring workers from the state. So where is this coming from and what are the rights uh, implications and what's the constitutional validity of this kind of um, a statement which the UP chief minister has made? Um, and what consequences for the right to mobility of the workers of which um, Aruna also spoke about? So I think if, if can we just go with the first round of questions and um, whoever wants to respond and then come back to a second um, uh, uh, set of questions. So could I please request um, Arun, uh, maybe Prabhada to talk about the options that uh, states have in terms of generating revenue or responding to the crisis which has fallen on their shoulders. You know, at this moment, the states have very few options because when they signed away their rights to levy indirect taxes by signing on to the GST. Basically, there were just three commodities left in which they could, uh, to some extent, muck about with the rates. One of them they're already doing, which is alcohol. You know, the Delhi government, the Haryana government, they're all raising the taxes on alcohol. But obviously, there are limits to this. Therefore, revenue raising on the part of the states, having bartered away the rights to do so through the GST uh, is something which is very difficult. Borrowing, yes, the borrowing limits have been raised recently, but you see, borrowing has a problem. Borrowing means you borrow at an interest rate. Now, that interest rate must be higher than the rate of growth of the state domestic product. If you are not going to fall into a debt trap, then a necessary condition is that the GSD, the, the, the GSDP growth rate must be higher than the interest rate at which you borrow. Now, you know, at this moment, uh, most state domestic products are going to experience either zero or even negative growth in the foreseeable future. To the extent that happens, borrowing at a positive interest rate from the market is actually going to make things worse worse for, for the state governments. So their options are extremely limited. As a matter of fact, they should demand that they be allowed to borrow from the Reserve Bank of India at zero interest rate, that their debt, in other words, should just be monetized. I think if all the states got together and demanded this, then that would have a big impact. Not that they're going to succeed, of course not. The center would not allow it. But on the other hand, it would actually focus discussion on the kind of plight of the states. And I believe they should demand zero interest borrowing from the Reserve Bank of India. Like the government of India does. Thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, Aruna, would you like to say something about uh, the UP government's um, recent um, uh, mentioning that um, other states will have to take permission to hire workers and what's the validity of such a there is absolutely no validity but it is a political strategy now that's going to be followed and I think I'm really afraid that because of the uh, fear psychosis about COVID 
that most of us as a nation have fallen in line with the restrictions on mobility. And I think restricting mobility is the first attempt of a government to control its people. Because freedom, I express my freedom through my freedom of expression, speech, and my freedom to travel. If I'm restricted in my freedom to travel, and I'm already restricted in my freedom to express, then how are we ever going to argue for those larger issues of dissent or disagreement or different points of view of a critique of what the government is doing or what anything we disagree with and the workers they will be forced to move and their mobility will be forced where they're needed somewhere else but they will be restricted from going where they want to go look at what happened to the migrants could it could there have been a greater tragedy you first give them four hours and in those four hours, you expect them to move. And then they want to go home. Look at the kinds of conditions that they were subjected to. Now, I really do think that this gives, underscores the fascist nature of the state. It underscores the fascist nature inherent in all these controlling mechanisms, including industry, including all the various people who use the labor. So I don't see any advantage in what UP has done. And I do think it's a kind of, trailer for what might happen everywhere and through restriction the first persons will be controlled are the labor but all other people who have the right to freedom of expression who have already been controlled in many different ways will be further controlled i do think mobility and the right to freedom and expression and the right to mobilize all go hand in hand and i think this is one more manifestation of the kinds of restrictions democratic restrictions that have been forced down our throats. So we'll have to resist it, we'll have to fight it, I think. Thanks. Um, a second set of questions is actually around um, what Prabhadda said um, in one of his comments that uh, uh, maybe we have to rebuild um, local rural economies and create uh, alternative ways of imagining development in this uh, uh, country or the path of development. So there are a number of people who are asking this question. How will that um, happen? What will happen to uh, labor demand in the cities if uh, labor is to be absorbed in agriculture, in local industries, how do we see uh, rebuilding rural economies? Um, uh, are they going to be at the cost of uh, uh, industrialization? What is the vision uh, which is um, um, uh, which, which you are saying um, uh, in, in this context? You know, I am not against industrialization. I want to make it very clear. I am simply talking about the fact that industrialization has to be led by the demand that comes from the agricultural sector, because that is the way to build a self-reliant economy. It has to be an export-led industrialization where export occurs from industry to agriculture, not from industry to all kinds of necessarily abroad, because then you are in a race uh, to lower your wages so that you remain competitive internationally and so on. So I'm really visualizing a development strategy where things get turned upside down. That basically agriculture grows on the basis of that. There is a demand that, that, that you have industrialization arising from that. And in the process, you actually have a, 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 a withering away of the distinction between the village and the city. Not that people are transferred from something called a village to something called a mega kind of megapolis, which we call the mm -hmm. city, but mm -hmm. rather the distinction between the two simply disappears. Right. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, there's a question for um, Patrick and also Gopal. Um, Patrick, you talked about um, we are seeing sliding back of democracy, pulverizing of uh, civil and political rights of workers and um, of poor people. Um, so in these circumstances, what will be an authoritarian, authoritarian government's response when it has uh, been uh, lost trust um, and it knows that it has um, lost it but it needs to continue to be in power so um, 
what's the future looking for um, civil rights movements, for trade unions, uh, for civil society activism? Uh, what would you like to say based on uh, what you are seeing uh, across the world? Patrick, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, no, that's, that's an incredibly important question. There's a running joke in the United States that the largest opposition party isn't the Democratic Party, it's the state of California. And I think one, one could make a, a similar joke in the Indian context that um, the biggest opposition to the, the central government are, are not the opposition political parties, but the states. And, and, and Kerala would be an obvious example. There, there's no doubt that in a crisis like this, uh, the, the instinct of any autocratic regime is to double down on authoritarianism. And, and that's what we've seen in Brazil, that's what we've seen in the United States, and it's what we're seeing in India. In India, it's a little more concerning simply because the BJP is so hegemonic. Uh, it, 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 it controls the, 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 the prime ministership, the executive powers, but it also controls uh, uh, the, the Lok Sabha, um, where, whereas in, in Brazil and the United States, there's at least some capacity for counter mobilization in political society. But I, 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 I have a lot of faith in Indian civil society. I'm members of this panel. Um, the, the, the depth of uh, commitment to the constitution as we saw in the CAA protests, um, the, the, the sheer uh, capacity for innovation and, and, and the, the kind of local alliances that uh, Mr. Vijayanand referred to. So I, I do have some faith in the capacity of civil society to, to respond, but uh, there's no doubt that what's at stake um, is, is not only just the extraordinary injustices and increasing inequalities that we've, we've talked about, but the, the, very, the very soul and, and essence of, of Indian democracy, which is a, a deep democracy in that it's uh, incredibly decentralized in the, in the nature of the actual practices, but of course is being threatened at its very heart, um, uh, given That's the attack on the voice. independence of civil society. Thanks. Um, Gopal, would you like to come in on this question as well? You'll have to unmute, uh, Gopal. You'll have to unmute, uh, Gopal. Unmute. Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so yes. Is, can you do without the state at this point in time? The answer is no, because you require a state to really uh, deal with the crisis. But what kind of state do you really want to have? Now, it's a very good opportunity for any state to actually reorient itself in favor of the people, people's demands. The first point that the state has to do is to become really pro-people, pro-humanitarian. That would mean that you, know, you must put your compassion, compassion before your reason, actually. You, know, you should immediately intervene and take people who are walking on the road into the buses and take them to their destination. And that is uh, very pragmatic, but that is what is required at this point in time. So you require a government which is actually compassionate it is, before it is uh, 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 reasonable to its own policy and its own economic packages. Now, uh, so there is an opportunity for the state to become uh, pro-people. And if it is not becoming pro-people, it is the duty of the civil society to actually make its ways. And therefore, I think civil society in our country, I don't know whether it is, and it, this is also a question to Patrick now. Uh, Patrick, uh, we have not a very robust civil society intervention in our country. Uh, it, it is already proved a number of times. Except for the philanthropic efforts, it is actually marvelous to help people in distress. And then we appreciate all that, all that help that they have actually given to people in distress and infestation. Now, so the question is, uh, can the state really give more spaces uh, to people, for example, labor, to express their freedom? And you can express your freedom, realize your freedom when you actually have opportunity. 
whether opportunities are there at the local level or, or in the metropolis. But you should give them enough, enough spaces, opportunities to redeem, realize their freedom. Otherwise, freedom will remain as as a very as, as a very vacuous, empty, empty concept. So I think there is a responsibility on the civil society and trade unions, of course, unions, uh, to actually bring necessary normative pressure on the state so that the state actually don't the state doesn't abandon the people and give them assurance, promises to reorient economy, opportunities, so that there is no, uh, there is, this, this is, I think, actually reorienting the state on a very egalitarian line. Now, this is a very uh, theoretical, hypothetical situation. Will they really do? Will they have willpower? We have no answer to this. So I think we have to actually be very vigilant. Civil society has to be energized and has to be socially vigilant to, to look after the social rights of the people. That's I think, I'm, I'm just sounding very, very, very theoretical, but at the moment we can really expect the state to actually acquire a new incarnation to itself. The civil society to remain vigilant. I think we're running out of time, but there's one last question which many people have asked in many different ways. Um, given our capacities, uh, given the capacities of civil society of mobilizing um, people uh, around real agendas and given the empathy of the state, uh, the union government, um, should we be redirecting uh, our efforts towards addressing um, state uh, governments and uh, mobilization efforts in the states. Um, so any final thoughts um, uh, will be welcome. Can I respond to that, Vijayana? Yeah, 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 Vijay, that's a good yeah. idea. I think the civil society should not even go to state government, they should go to the local government. There they are needed. And local action may not be advocacy and rights-based initially, but it is rights-based silently, their livelihood their social rights. And there, there's a lot of space in India because local governments in 95% of India has no, have no uh, capacity in terms of HR. So this is one way of getting your agenda widespread. And whatever be the deficiencies of panchayats, which Ambedkar has rightly pointed out, this is the only place where social democracy and political democracy can start thanks to our self-help groups, which are 6 million, and elected representatives were 3 million. So it's a huge possibility. And this is a point to Professor Heller. We have been dialoguing. But I find Kerala moving from a welfare state to a caring state. So it is possible even with huge fiscal stress. Thank you. Thanks. Um, May I just add? Uh, yes, Saruna, please. I actually think we have forgotten how to get to people. We get to the people, we get a fund of common sense, we get a fund of possibilities, we also get a method and a structural arrangement through which we can do something. And I think that is why this present government, in its astuteness and its cleverness, and I don't think it is an intelligent government, has put folks in so many ways that we can't get to each other and can't talk. So I think primarily that is possible and we should try and get over it. The question is, it's a challenge and we, apart from Zoom and other such virtual media, mm. we'll have to get to places where we can get together, talk and do something. And I think it is possible. So, no, no, um, there are more questions, but um, I don't know whether we have uh, now the time. It's um, already eight past, and we have um, other people waiting. Um, Aditi Mehta will come in now to say a few words, and then we have to conclude. So, Aditi, uh, on behalf of the Constitution Conduct Group, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah. Hello, Harsh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank, yes, you. thank you. So it's been absolutely scintillating. I have to really uh, say it's just been breathtaking to hear everybody because everyone has really focused so clearly 
on um, on really on, on what the situation we are facing i would just say on behalf of uh, our group that perhaps this is a wonderful time as prabhada said for just a real visioning of society i mean he mentioned that um, you know try and think actually of how uh, employment can come to agriculture rather than people from agriculture seeking employment in mega cities and so on but i think these things have to be fleshed out I and mean, what is peasant agriculture in today's context and we have added conditions what is the craft economy and so on and the second point that i think again everyone has really adequately mentioned is just the fact that democratic rights of civil society of people of around the gamut have been completely suppressed and there's been a huge concentration of just any kind of rights any kind of um, forward movement or any kind of intellectual thought on any anyone's part so i think these are the two things that um, i think i would also like to just say that maybe there is need for a you know as as um, as ashish kothari asim shivas have they talk about uh, you know deep ecology so what would that be how is that going to be translated and i think we should start thinking about it and otherwise uh, you know this conversation you've begun i think i'm looking forward to it continue thank you so thank you so much uh, aditi uh, and uh, thank you my very dear friends i think uh, it was truly a very 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 important conversation uh, i do believe that we are in a moment uh not just of unprecedented crisis uh after independence but also uh, it it's a civilizational crisis it's not just a humanitarian crisis it, it is a crisis of the kind of people we are and have become and have allowed ourselves to become and i think that that we we uh, we're witnessing a moment for uh it, it, it of of moral crisis in in this in this civilizational moment uh and and therefore the new imagination uh, uh that 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 we talked about is extremely valuable uh, uh while uh while uh our brothers and sisters uh in 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 city slums and city streets and much more in, in the countryside and uh in, in the forests uh and uh, the coastal regions are going to face uh what i fear of a near famine like uh, you know conditions uh they're going to face uh, the outcome the consequences of 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 the of the spread of the contagion where where there will be no facilities for them to respond it requires the very best in all of us in this moment of civilizational crisis to stand in true solidarity uh, with them at this moment but also to ensure Uh, to promise ourselves that we will not allow uh, a situation of this kind to recur in our country uh, thank you thank you all of you